Um, hey, as we jump into that, if you have your Bibles, want to go to Genesis chapter 6. That's where we'll be this evening. Uh, man, I was just sitting back there as we were singing that new song, and it was talking about building my life upon something, building my life upon that sure foundation of God's love. And then I just love the chorus. talks about leading me in your love to those around me. And I was just thinking about the connection between that, the connection between the type of people in your life and the type of people in my life who build their life upon the foundation of God's love and that leads them to the people around them. And the reason I was considering that so deeply tonight is because really tonight and for the next three weeks, uh, we want to talk to you about a subject and that subject is this. I want to talk to each of you about what it would look like for you to build the type of life for yourself, for you to live the type of life that would have a generational kind of impact. Uh, let me repeat that. I want to talk to you about what it would look like for you to build the type of life that would have a generational impact on this world, meaning that you would live a life that would last in terms of its impact and difference it makes in the world long after this generation is dead and gone. That you would live the type of life that people generations from now would look back and recognize your impact. Whether that is a global impact where you change the world or, or whether it's a smaller, more local impact where you've just changed your family tree. I want each of us in this room to begin thinking about what it would look like to live the type of life that has a generational impact. Uh, and so what we're going to look at today is one of these stories. We're going to look at four stories in the month of April here. And my hope is that as you study these stories, as you think about these stories, as you consider what the word of God might have to say to you, that you would consider how God might use you, how God might shape you, how you may build your life on the foundation of God's love, that you might have that kind of general, generational impact in our time and in our season. So if you have your Bible, uh, we'll be in Genesis chapter 6. Uh, if you have it on your phone, you can pull that up to you. We'll have it up on the screen as well. It begins this way. Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. This is the very first book of the Bible, the sixth chapter. It begins this way. It says, this is the account of Noah and his family. This is the story of Noah and the ark. Uh, if you grew up in church, you heard this story before. Uh, you probably saw a little cute video or you made a flannel graph. Those are kind of out now, but you made one when you were young. That was a thing. Um, so you know this story, the story of Noah building an ark and all of the animals going on to the ark. Now, if you're not a Christian, or maybe you didn't grow up in church, maybe this story is unfamiliar to you, and so we're going to read it tonight. And here's what I'm sure of. I'm sure that there are going to be some of you in this room who, as we read this story, are going to become increasingly skeptical about whether something like this ever happened. And maybe even as a Christian, you have a lot of questions about this to go, okay, was this a literal story? Did this actually happen? Or was this something just kind of made up by ancient people to talk about the world? And, and here's just what I want to say. If you have questions about this story, if you have doubts about this story, if you want to dive into things like, okay, where'd the water come from? And where'd it all go? And how'd this all work? Those are good questions to ask. But ultimately, my, my, my hope and my desire tonight is not to address those questions. And here's why. It's not because it's not a valid question. It's because here's the principle I've come to in my life, and I hope this might be useful to some of you. Um, whenever I come across a story in the Bible that it might be hard for me to believe, my principle is this, that if I can believe the very first words of the Bible, I can believe any miracle in the Bible. Here's what I mean by that. The Bible begins in this way. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, meaning that the Bible begins, the very first sentence claims that God spoke and out of nothing, everything came into existence. The idea of the beginning of the Bible is that there was nothing, God spoke and everything came into existence. And if I can believe Genesis 1-1, that in the beginning, God created everything, I can believe every other miracle in the Bible. Like if God can literally speak and the entire universe can come into being, I can believe that Noah built a boat, okay? If God can speak and everything came into being, I can believe that Moses parted the Red Sea. I can just believe that. It's not difficult for me to believe in miracles if I can believe in the God of creation. And that's what I hope some of you would see tonight. And so again, if you think it's outlandish, some of these miracles in the Bible, I would agree with you were it not for the God who speaks in Genesis 1-1 and everything comes into creation. We as intelligent thinking Christians don't just believe miracles like this happen. We believe that there is a God who does these miracles. It is the same God who created the heavens and the earth. So here's what I'm going to say tonight. I believe in the story of Noah. I believe the story of Noah is true. 
I believe there was a real man who built a real boat in a real flood who was responding to a real God who gives real commands. In fact, this is what I'd say, and this is the most important thing I hope you would hear from me tonight, that ultimately the story of Noah is not about a boat. The story of Noah is about obedience. The story of Noah is not ultimately about a flood. The story of Noah is about faithfulness. That's what this story is about. And all the things we're going to see in this story are going to point toward a God who commands and a person who responds in obedience. Here's how it goes. Verse 9 says, this is the account of Noah and his family. It goes on to say, Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So here's what it tells us. That there's a God who commands, there's a God who creates, and then there's this man named Noah. And Noah's going to be used in a mighty way in this story. And here's one of the things I love about the story of Noah. It doesn't leave us to guess on why God chooses to use Noah. It tells us right here in the text everything we need to know about Noah. He is a righteous man. He is blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. He has righteousness. He has faithfulness. He has blamelessness. In other words, God commands, and Noah responds. God commands, and Noah says yes. God tells Noah what to do. He listens and says yes. He listens to God, and he does what he says. That ultimately the reason God chooses to use Noah to build an ark is because Noah had spent his entire life building a life and building an obedience to God where he said yes to God at every single turn. And here's what I need you to see tonight. That ultimately the only people in the Bible who God uses in crazy, incredible, generational kind of impacts ways are the type of people who are willing to say yes to him even when God tells them to do something crazy. That over and over and over again, if you read this book, you're going to find average, ordinary people who God speaks to, and because of their response of faith, God uses them in mighty ways. It's true of Noah. It's true of Moses. It's true of Elijah. It's true of Jeremiah. It's true of Peter. It's true of Paul. It's true of Timothy. All of these heroes of the Bible aren't special, unique, fantastic people. They're average, ordinary people who had the courage to listen to God and to do what he says. To listen to God and to do what he says. And that's ultimately going to be true for your life and mine. If we want to have the type of life that has a generational impact, meaning if we want to have the type of life that lasts far beyond our generation, far after we're dead and gone, we have to be the type of people who listen to God and do what he says. But then ultimately, here's what I'm going to say, and this may be obvious to some of you, but in order to listen to God and do what he says, you have to be the type of person who can listen to God. You have to be the type of person who can actually hear God's voice and respond to God's prompting in your life. And then here would be my contention. You will never become that type of person until you become the type of person who is obsessed with this book. I just really mean that. You will never be the type of person who will listen to God and respond to what he says until you become the type of person who loves your Bible, who knows your Bible who memorizes your Bible, who, who sits there and reads it and considers it and thinks on it and studies it, who gets in a room like this and sits under the teaching of the word and then you go out on your own and study it by yourself. When you get into rooms of Bible studies and small groups and open up this book, and, and the reason this book is so important is because until you know this book, you won't know what God sounds like. And when God prompts your heart, you won't know it was him because you don't know what kinds of things God says to people. So if you want to become the type of person who has a generational impact on this world, maybe the first step for some of you is to become the type of person who knows and loves this book. Is it hard to read sometimes? Yes. Is it confusing at times? Absolutely. I said this the other week, though. Great thing about the Bible. You get to a verse you don't understand. Here's the wonderful thing. You move on to the next verse. You keep going, okay? But seriously... I wonder if some of you have a call that God is putting on your life, like God is speaking to you, he's whispering you, he's nudging you in a direction that he wants to use you for a great and glorious and grand generational impact on this world, but you can't hear him because you don't know what he sounds like. 
Uh, and some of you have heard me share, share the story that early on in high school, God really prompted my heart to start reading the Bible. And I wasn't a reader. I was an athlete. I was a jock. I thought reading was for, for losers. And I, I was stupid. Um, and so here I am, a sophomore in high school. God starts to prompt my heart uh, to start reading the Bible. And it just becomes a regular part of my life. Uh, and, and then here's the other part of my story that later on, senior year of high school, I believe that's when God really came and got a hold of my life and started calling me into ministry. But then here's what I can see in retrospect. If I had not started becoming obsessed with the word of God when I was early in high school, I never would have heard the call later in high school. If I hadn't known this is what God sounds like, this is what it's like when the Holy Spirit of God nudges me and whispers me and pushes me in a direction, I never would have heard that call if I had not known the word of God. So I just want to plead with some of you as you consider what it might look for your life to have a generational kind of impact to become the type of person who loves this book. It, it continues on this way. It says in verse 11, it says, the earth was corrupt in God's sight and full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become for all the people had become corrupted in their ways. And I don't know about you, but I, I read this verse uh, about what happens here in the very beginning of history, and it actually saddens my heart on some level that the earth hasn't changed that much, right? Uh, like we see these things, the earth was corrupt, it's full of violence. It's not as if in all of, of the years that have passed since this time that the earth has somehow progressed to this better place. Sometimes we have this imagination that human beings used to be these awful, evil, savage people, and now we've become these noble, dignified, good people. But the actual story of the Bible is that the human heart has not changed. The actual story of the Bible is that you can go from generation to generation to generation and the externals change, but the human heart doesn't. Uh, like, I don't know about you. Okay, I was born in 1988, um, which puts me squarely in the camp of millennial, which makes me one of the people everyone loves to hate, right? We're like this room, we know this well, right? You're, you may be a millennial, you may even be younger than that, and everyone just loves to hate you uh, because you're lazy, you're entitled, and you eat too much avocado toast, okay? Like, that's the deal, right? And everyone hates you, and everyone just thinks you're the worst, right? And we hear that, and, and here's the great thing about mo those of us who are millennials, when we hear people hating on millennials, um, we're not mad because because it's wrong, right? We're like, yeah, okay, I, can see, I do like toast. You know, like that's not why we're mad. We're mad because ultimately it's not like every other generation had it right and we have it wrong. It's not like the human heart has changed in the last 40 or 100 or 200 or 2,000 years. The same human heart that was corrupt and violent in the beginning is still corrupt and violent. Like the ultimate need for each generation that comes is not for us to pretend that they have different problems than us. The ultimate way we impact a coming generation, the generations to come, is by recognizing that the same problem with our hearts is going to be the problem with their hearts. That we're filled with corruption and violence, bent toward sin, and the only salvation for that sin is the love of God in Christ. That's how we look at that. We say nothing has changed about the human heart. They are still, we are all still desperate for the love and the grace of Jesus. It, it continues on this way in verse 13. It says, so God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all the people of the earth, for it is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So most of us, if you grew up in church at all, and I don't assume all of you grew up in church, but for those of you that did, we studied this as an elementary school student or as an early like, child. Like in, in preschool years, we studied this story, and that's a good thing. We teach the story at our church, and we should. It's a beautiful story of how God saves and God rescues. But here's the thing. I don't want you to stick with your mental model of this story of how you learned it when you were three. I want you to realize that this is an intense story. This is a horrific story. And in fact, there are parts of the Bible, if they were a movie, I probably wouldn't watch it. And this is one of them. This is God saying, I'm going to put an end to all human life. That everyone is going to be drowned and washed away. This is God's judgment being poured out upon the earth so that when we read this story, I don't want us just thinking of a cute story where everything's happy and nice. I want us realizing that this is a story where the stakes could not be higher. The stakes are huge. And if you want to live the type of life that has a generational impact, hear me on this, you need to understand that the stakes are high. The stakes are higher than you could possibly imagine. The stakes are so high that you don't have time to mess around. You don't have time to play games. You don't have time to waste your life. There are people dying in our world without Christ. There are people living in this world without hope. 
There are people living in the midst of all kinds of brutal oppression all over the world, all kinds of crushing poverty all over the world. There are people suffering everywhere. The stakes are enormous. And if you want to be the type of person who lives a life that has a generational impact, you've got to begin with being the type of person who realizes how high the stakes are. Your life's not a game. Your life's not to be wasted. Some of you have lived in such a way that you think someday you're going to start to live a life that makes a difference, but for now you're just going to enjoy being young, and I just think that's nonsense. I think Christ calls you to a life that matters, to a life that makes a difference, to a life that sees the stakes just like Noah says. Noah sees this and goes, the entire world's going to be wiped out, but God's given me a mission to preserve humanity and pass it along. And in the same way, God has given you a mission. God has given you something he wants you to do. Not sometime later in your life, not when you get around to it, not when you have a lot of money, but God has called you to see how high the stakes are and to step into the game. It continues on this way, verse 14. It says, it, this is God speaking still. He says, so make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening of one cubit high all around. Put a door on the side of the ark and make a lower and middle and upper decks. So God looks at Noah and says, the stakes are higher than you could possibly imagine. And then ultimately God is going to look at Noah and say that he's not just called to be sad about that. He's not just called to pray about it. He's ultimately called to do something about it. He's called to do something about it. See, ultimately what God has called us to is not just to feel bad about the world. It's not just to dream about things, but it's to ultimately put our faith into action and do something. It's one of the things I notice here in the story. There's a verb. It's make it. You've got to make something. You've got to do something with it. Simply having thoughts about how much you ache for the world won't count. Tweeting out how much you stand with people who are oppressed ultimately won't count if you don't do anything about it. We've got to step into it. It's not just social media activism or talking about how bad you feel about the world. It's going and doing something. I'll show you this picture. Um, this last week, I got an opportunity with a team from our high school ministry to go to Uganda. Um, and, and we go to Uganda and we go out to um, this place kind of really remote out from the city and we brought the team around this grave site. And this grave site is the grave to a man uh, that Calvary has partnered with and had partnered with for many, many years named Pastor Dongo. Pastor Dongo was a man who was involved um, in Uganda and, and really what began as him just welcoming some orphans who didn't have food and didn't have a place to stay into his family eventually developed into his church and some, some schools he created to love and serve the children of Uganda. This week when we were there with this team, um, we, we got the opportunity to serve with about 1,500 um, people who were part of those schools, about 800 in the primary school, 700 in the secondary and the high school. It's a remarkable thing that he accomplished, that he did. He had a passion for it. He had a heart for it. And ultimately, he decided not just to feel bad for the Ugandans, not just feel bad for the people, but he decided to do something about it and take his faith and put it into action. And the reason we bring high school students around this grave is to show them that a few years ago, back in 2015, Pastor Dongo passed away. But the most beautiful thing about his life is everything he did in the Lord, everything he did had a generational kind of impact where Pastor Dongo is gone, but his mission continues. His mission continues and flourishes because he lived the type of life where God spoke and gave him a heart and a passion for something, and he didn't just think about it, he didn't just talk about it, he did something. And, and so here we are tonight. And my question for you is, what's God calling you to do? What's God calling you to be about? What's the passion God's put on your heart? The thing, I, I, listen, for most of you, it's not going to be orphans in Uganda, and that's okay. God doesn't call all of us to the same thing, but he does call us to something. And ultimately, my question for you tonight is, is God calling you? As God calls you out, are you going to respond by a faith that actually puts that into action, or are you just going to respond by sitting back and hoping things get better? 
We stand around this grave of this man and we realize that to have a generational impact means one day we're all going to be gone. But prayerfully, we have done things. We have put things into action just like Noah did where he built this ark and it set into motion something that lasts far beyond our lifetime. It continues on this way in verse 17. God says, I'm going to bring floodwaters to the earth and destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has breath and life in it, everything on earth will perish, but I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark and you and your sons and your wives and your wives' sons or your sons' wives with you. I want you to see this, that God says, I'm going to bring judgment upon the earth. I'm going to judge the sin and the wickedness and the violence and the corruption of the earth. I'm going to do that. But then there's this beautiful biblical word here that I don't want you to miss. He says, but... But uh, I'm going to establish a covenant with you. So this is the thing about our God. God doesn't owe Noah anything. God could totally wipe out Noah with everything else and start over. But the good news of our God, the good news of the Bible, is that our God decides to come into covenant, into agreement, into relationship with us. Not because we've earned it, not because we deserve it, not because God owes you or I anything. He steps into relationship with us because he is good and he is gracious, and that is the message of the gospel. If you're here tonight and you're just a guest and you're just checking this out, you're not really sure about the whole church thing, here's what you need to know. That the fundamental truth of Christian faith, the center of Christian faith, is not what you have done for God or will do for God. It's what God has done for you. It's that before you wanted anything to do with our God, he wanted something to do with you. When he could have just wiped you out like Noah here, he says, I will establish a covenant with you. And that same covenant that God gives, that giving, life-giving, gracious covenant where he says, I'm going to extend that grace to you. He wants to extend it to you. See, ultimately, the type of people who make a generational impact on this world are the type of people who receive the goodness and the grace of God's covenant, who step into that, who say, God, I didn't earn it, I don't deserve it, and yet you invite me into relationship with you. Here's how the story ends. It says, you were to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, and to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird and every kind of animal and every kind of creature that moves along the ground. You will come to you and be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away for you and for them. Now, God gives this instruction. And this week I was sitting thinking about it a little, um, of what this must have been like for Noah. Maybe you never sat and thought about what it would be like for Noah to get this instruction. God says to him this. He says, you are to bring two of all the living creatures into the ark. So first off, he's got to build an ark. And there's a lot of speculation on how long it takes him to build an ark. And there's all sorts of talk. But maybe it's like 40, 50, 60, 70 years. Like it's taking him a while. But then I was just thinking about, God says, you're going to find two of every living creatures. Do you think at some point Noah went... How many creatures are there? And as he sits down and he like gets a piece of paper, which he doesn't have, but he sits down and he writes on whatever, a log, and he goes, okay, what creatures are there? He goes, okay, birds. Um, and he goes, b- 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 cows. And then p- penguins, right? I, mean, I don't know. Like he's just kind of like, p- how many creatures are there? At some point he has to sit down and figure out how many creatures. Have you ever thought about what it would be like for him to actually go get all the creatures? Like to be like, all right, I'm going to find an ostrich. Like, I don't know. Like he had to go find it at some point right? Here's the crazy thing. Like sometimes the Bible describes things like this and it's like a verse or two and it moves on. This was probably decades of his life fulfilling the task that God gave him. And I wonder if that stands as a reminder to anyone here that some of you want God to move fast in your life, but our God's interested in moving fully, okay? Some of you want God to move quickly in your life, but our God wants to move completely in your life. That many of us are in our 20s and we're excited and we want to go change the world and we want to go do something. But ultimately, God may want to do something with you. It just may be 50 years from now. And the question is, do you have the type of humility and patience to say, God, whatever you have for me, whatever you want for me, I'm in. Even if it takes an entire lifetime, God, I trust you enough to let you use me in your timing. That's what I wonder if some of us have to consider tonight. That we want to make a generational kind of impact on this world. And God asks us to be patient, to be steadfast, and to stay the course. It ends with these words. It said, Noah did everything just as God had commanded him. 
It ends with the statement that God, that Noah does everything just as God commanded him. And ultimately, I'm going to close tonight by just saying this. Um, if you want to be the type of person in this world who makes a generational kind of impact, if you want to be the type of person who changes generations to come, you need to be the type of person who says, God, whatever you tell me you want me to do, I'm going to do. Whatever you push me toward, I'm going to say yes to. Whatever I see in your word, whatever commandment, I'm going to step out in faith, even if I don't understand it, even if I don't like it on its surface, even if I don't understand why I'm supposed to do this. If you want to be the type of person that impacts this world beyond your generation, you must be the type of person who says yes to God over and over and over and over again. And imagine what would happen in your life if you were the type of person who said yes to God no matter what it took. And then further, I'm going to invite us for a few minutes tonight to consider what would happen if not just individuals, but if everyone in this room said yes to God over and over and over again. If everyone in this room could have this written on their tombstone, that Brian did everything just as God commanded, that Jacob did everything just as God commanded, that you did everything just as God commanded. Imagine what would happen if a church rallied around that very idea. And to help you imagine what that could look like, to help you imagine where that might fit into our lives and our stories, uh, I'm going to invite up right now, and you, you guys have had him up on the stage before, but it's our honor and privilege tonight uh, to have, I'm going to be co-teaching, and I just want to invite up our senior pastor, Sean Thornton, to help us imagine and see that. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. I love that. Brian did everything just as God commanded him. Uh, wouldn't that be a great thing to have put on your tombstone one day? that your name could go in that place. But as Brian uh, was teaching, you know, this all began with God's grace to him. His obedience is not to gain anything from God, but it's based on the grace God has already shown him. And so when God calls him to do something that has a generational impact, it's based on the goodness and love of God that's been shown to him. And based on that goodness and love, he then says, I'm going to obey. And he did everything that God commanded him. At Calvary in this month of April, in the young adults as well as in our, our services on Saturday night and Sunday morning, we have an emphasis on this idea of building a life that leaves a lasting legacy, generations. And, and part of that that's important for us to understand is, yes, we need to do that individually so that, yes, one day God could even say to us, you did what I commanded you to do. You lived according to the way I wanted you to live. You made an impact on the lives of those in the generations behind you, and you impacted those around you. And then there's a part of this that we are not just individuals, we're part of God's family, and God's family has expressions in, uh, in local churches. And so a local church like Calvary Community Church is one of dozens, if not hundreds of churches within our region who name the name of Jesus and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ week in and week out. And we're believers who are seeking to live in love like Jesus, God's children together, and we seek to point each other in that direction. And in local churches like Calvary, we organize and we gather together and we hold one another accountable and we walk together in this journey so that together we can make an impact locally and globally. As Pastor Brian was talking about being there in Uganda and, uh, and hearing him talk about my friend Pastor Dongo uh, really uh, grabbed a hold of my heart and reminded me of his faithfulness and the call that we have to be faithful in our lives. And so for us as a church, collectively, including you who are part of young adults, and we want to make an impact locally in the lives of people who are hurting and people who are without the hope of Jesus. Calvary's been around for 42 years. It's a little younger than I am, but it's been around a while, and it has sought to minister in a number of different generations now. As a matter of fact, back in 2016, we challenged our congregation at the end of the year 2016 in our Christmas offering to give in such a way that we'd be accomplishing some special stuff into 2017. And one of those things was to give so that we could invest in young adults, the next generation. And we were able to do more to come alongside you and to invite you to be a part of us and to impact the young adults of, of this generation in our community. And we consider you a part of who we are. And there are people who have gone before you, who've gone before me, who've invested so that we could be on this campus. 20 years ago, I moved from Via Colinas over here. There are people who have invested so there can be staff and others to, to walk alongside you and to help you worship and grow as you're taught God's word and to help disciple you so you understand what it means to follow Jesus. 
And just as other generations have poured into me, I've attempted to pour into the generations that follow. And just as others have poured into you and are pouring into you, you have an opportunity to pour into those around you in your own generation and into the next generation for Jesus. So that you can be like Noah, someone whose life is built over decades in such a way that you leave a lasting impact for Jesus Christ on others. There's a verse that is really at the heart of what we're talking about in this month of April. It's found in Psalm 78, 6. And I think this is a verse that really echoed in the heart of Noah as he obeyed God and did what God commanded him to do. And he became a part of God's extended grace to his generation, the generations to follow. Psalm 78, 6 says, so the next generation would know. What would it know? Well, the earlier verses say the love of God, the goodness of God, the grace of God, the justice of God. And then we read, even the children yet to be born. Now, you all are at a stage of life where probably in the next, you know, statistics show in the next 10 years, you're, you're going to be, many of you getting married, some of you having kids, some of you finding careers that, that you, you are going to continue with, some of you are yet to go on to grad school. There are a variety of things. Some of you are in grad school now. You're at different stages of your careers and your life. A lot changes in the next 10 years of your life. And you have an opportunity in how you live in these next few weeks and months and years and to build a life that lasts beyond your own and that lasts and makes an impact for Jesus. And we invite you in this month of April, as you saw the fly through of what uh, the project we're working on is meant to do, we're inviting you to join us in this journey. As others have invested in me and invested in you, we get an opportunity in April to invest in the generation that we're a part of and the generations to come through our generations campaign here at Calvary. And what does that mean? Well, for us, ultimately, it's kind of like what you heard in the story of Noah. Uh, first, as a church, we get to extend God's grace and goodness to others. It doesn't take you long to watch the news and see the injustices of this world, the brokenness, the poverty, the hatred, the, the abuse, uh, the vileness. And as you look at this world, there is a need for God's grace to be seen in those who name the name of Jesus, to be extended from those who name the name of Christ. And we get to do that into our community. One of the core features of our Generations campaign is to create a community outreach center. And we have a number of programs that feed the homeless regularly. We have an overnight shelter that's a part of our church. And we have a, a fresh market ministry, a food pantry. We, we provide the food for hundreds of families every month through our, our food pantry, our fresh market, our free meals program. And these are people, many of them working poor. They can afford to get, drive to work, but they can barely afford to keep the, the hotel room they rent or the, the apartment they rent. They can barely put things together to have food. And we're able to come alongside them and help them and to do that in Jesus' name. And that community outreach center is going to take our ministry to those who are marginalized and suffer and often are overlooked in our community. And we're going to be able to show them in a very practical way the love of Jesus. We'll also be able to extend the grace of God to generations to come as we uh, impact uh, children in early childhood and elementary and middle school and even, even to affect those kids who are, are affected by disability and, and, and their families. We want to extend God's grace and show them love that often they don't experience in the brokenness of this world. We want to make sure that we address the injustices that are found in our community and our world around us at all times. We believe we can do that even as we're a part of the Generations Campaign. And then to respond in obedience. To respond in obedience to what God has called our elders and, and our church leaders. We believe God has called us in this direction. Just as we believe back in 2016, God had called us to add funding to the young adult ministry and to be able to create a space and a place for you to come and worship and be able to celebrate Jesus together. And in this, this month of April, we're going to talk about enhancing our tools. The buildings in this campus are not about, uh, not about uh, the, the mission in the sense that that's not at the core of who we are. We're not about buildings and, and, and this campus. But those are tools to help us reach other people and to help other followers of Jesus grow. And so we not only get to extend the grace of God, as we have this focus on generations throughout the month of April, but we have the opportunity to step out in obedience to what God has called us to as a church in investing in the future of this church. We sit here today 
recognizing that there are, are people before us who prayed, who gave, so that we could be on this campus, we could have these buildings. There are people who give regularly so the lights can stay on. There's no foundation or denomination or major donor behind us that takes care of all this. It's all of us who are part of the Calvary family, and it's all of us who enjoy the blessings of the investments of generations before us. And now we get to, even as we think about our own lives having a, a generational impact, we get to be a part of a church family seeking to make a generational impact that will last decades uh, in, in terms of its impact on lives. I, uh, I know that as you think about and as you're asked in this month to perhaps give toward the Generations campaign, some of you say, well, I'm in college or I'm just getting started. I can barely buy gas to get where I got to go. I get that. I was there too. And I, I remember the first time somebody said in church that maybe I, at a young age, could give toward a, a project that would help the church create new tools and enhance tools to reach more people with the love and hope of Jesus Christ. And I remember at the age of 14 being challenged about that. And our pastor got up and in my home church in Indiana, he said, you know, even if you, you give $5, $2, $3, I said, well, I can't even give that. And so I, I started thinking about it, and he said, just ask God to give you an opportunity. And I had, I had an opportunity to do some work for a great uncle of, of mine and, and trim some bushes. He was older, and, and he gave me a, a few dollars for that. And, and I was able then to take that and put it into what was called the Joash offering. Our church was trying to clean up some of the brokenness of the building and get it freshened up to reach that generation. And I remember that as I took just those couple of extra dollars that came my way, and I made a choice to give those rather than maybe buy a Coke or something else, as I gave that, I learned a very important lesson that continues with me today. The giving is not only about the people that will be affected or the project that's being, that's being completed to help other people come to know and love Jesus, but it was about me recognizing that every good and perfect gift comes from God. That as Noah recognized the grace of God, everything that comes into my life, the ability to do my job, to study, to do whoever it was, I have learned over the years that it comes from God. And for me, just to whatever, and you can say, well, that's, that's not that big a deal. That wouldn't make that much of an impact on the kind of project we saw today and the kind of dollars that will be needed to do that. No, but I want to invite you, even if you think what you might give in this month of April, especially we get to a, a commitment weekend coming up later, and you guys will lead us in that weekend later in the month of April, and we'll talk about that. I want to invite you to join us, not just to make that impact in terms of right now, but I think you'll grow, and you'll learn, and be reminded that every good and perfect gift, and so as my wife Leslie and I consider what we're going to give, we're praying about what God would have us give, not just about the project itself, but so we can grow, and learn that everything comes from the Lord, and we get to be stewards of that, managers of that, and we get to invest that even in his kingdom work through our local church. Just as Noah built a life that had a lasting impact in the generations to come and in his own generation, we as a church get to be a church that pours into this generation, the generation yet to come, and even their children can hear of the goodness of God. I want to invite you in the month of April to pray about what God might have you give. And some of you, it might be a dollar. Some of you, it might be three dollars. Some of you, I don't know where you come from or how God has blessed you. It might be five thousand dollars. I don't know what it is. But between you and the Lord, talk about the good gifts God has given you in His grace. And then step out in obedience and give as God prompts you to give as a part of our church. Because we consider those of you who, who come here on Thursday night a part of our, even if you don't consider yourself that you didn't grow up here, this isn't your core church, we consider you a part of our church family. And here's an opportunity to make a difference in lives beyond yours locally and generationally. <coughs> I, uh, I think of a lady who came up to me uh, just a couple of months back, and she said, three years ago I approached the church for financial help. We have a benevolence ministry where we will help people pay an electric bill or, or a heating bill or just something, basic needs. We'll give people a card to go to the gas station or to buy groceries, whatever their needs are. And we literally give away tens of thousands of dollars that way. And we, we do it with some accountability because we don't just give to people who might be taking advantage of us. We give to people. And she came up to me and she said, three years ago, I came to the church for help. I didn't attend here. She was a young single mom, just, just maybe around 30 years of age. And she said, I came here, and I'd been to a number of other community 
uh, service groups and even some government programs that provide for people who are having a hard time. And she said, and I left each of those places feeling like I was just dirt. She said, they, they treated me like I was trash. They talked down to me for being in this situation. And she said, I came here. And when the people met with me in the care ministry here and some volunteers helped me for a couple of weeks with food and, and some gas money and other things to help me get myself established, they treated me like I mattered. That, that God knew me and cared about me. And she said, I started coming here and I brought my baby here and that baby's now a, a toddler and, and, and is, is a part of the, the church's early childhood and, and I'm coming here and, and I'm learning and I'm growing. And she said, I just want to thank you and Calvary for showing me dignity and showing me love and that God loved me even when I was at the end of my rope and didn't know where things were going to come from next. You cared for me. That's what we want to continue. That's what's happened to the generations before us. That's what I inherited when I came here as pastor 10 years ago. That's what we've attempted to do for the 10 years I've been here. And our elders and our leadership are moving forward to continue that kind of investment. And we invite you to join us together so that not only we as individuals, Sean or you, can leave a life that has lasting impact, but that we together as a church can have a lasting impact locally and globally and generationally for Jesus Christ. So join us in this journey. Think about it during this month. Am I developing the kind of life, am I building the kind of life that leaves, leaves a generational impact? Am I participating with a local church that's seeking to leave a generational impact? This is what April's about. Join us in this journey. Father, thank you for what Pastor Brian shared. Thank you for the truth of your word and help us to extend the grace you've shown us, the goodness and love you've shown us to others. And Father, help us to step out in obedience. Help us to step out in obedience and do what maybe some in this room already know what you're prompting them to do. They know what your word says about how they should be li living. Maybe your word has guided them with some principles that they need to be carrying out. Help them to have the boldness and courage to do that, even as Noah did. And then help us, Father, as a congregation, as a church family, to reach into the lives of others with the goodness and grace of God, even through our Generations campaign. Help us, Lord, to obey you and what you've called us to as a church family to impact the people around us locally, people all around the world globally who are broken and hurting and need the hope of Christ. Help us to leave a generational impact. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.